sounds simple. It sounds, um, you know, you hear it a lot. But it's absolutely true that if we put down the Word of God and start thinking for ourselves, Jeremiah 10, 23 says, it's not within man to guide his own steps. We need to go strictly by the Word of God. In this morning's lesson about opportunities that we have day by day, month by month, that sometimes we miss and the tragic events of the opportunities that were lost by Adam and Eve, the people of Noah's day, um, the thief on the cross, and those events, those things, Felix, those opportunities that were lost, and I kind of left this off of the end of the sermon this morning because I got emotional about Jill. Sorry about that. What I left off of that was each of those lost opportunities resulted in death. Fearful death. Think about that thief that blasphemed Christ. He could have been in paradise that very day. All he had to do was to take advantage of an opportunity. Tonight as we look at a lost soul, I want you to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 16. Now this sermon is entitled A Lost Soul. That's a disguise for the actual um, content of the sermon. If there's ever a, a sermon on hell, this is it. And if you get up on Sunday morning or the week before and say, next Sunday night we're going to talk about hell, you might be standing there preaching to yourself. Not that y'all wouldn't have come back. You're very dedicated and I appreciate that. But as a minister of the gospel, as a congregation of the Lord's church, we need to have balance in our preaching. And balanced preaching includes lessons on hell. The last time I recall that I preached, I have several other lessons that uh, address the idea of Hades and hell. The last time I preached the sermon on hell, I was really uh, taken back by the amount of comments and feedback that I got that went something like this. You know, it has been a long, long time or years since we've heard a message on that. And I thought, wow. Now, listen, you know me well enough to know I'm not going to stand up before a crowd every Sunday or every other Sunday and talk about hell and torment and damnation. It is an aspect of, of biblical content, but we need balanced preaching. Balanced preaching is very effective. In Luke chapter 16 and verse 19, we see uh, a passage uh, in our Bibles that talks about the rich man Lazarus. This is a, a very familiar verse and a familiar passage for many of us. But when people die, um, they get carried away by angels. Their spirit gets carried away to a place called Hades. Hades is a two-section place. And this sermon is not about the content or makeup of Hades, but the fact that it exists. And in Luke chapter 19, we start reading, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 16, we start reading in verse 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came to lick his wounds. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off. And he said, he cried out to him. No, 
Let me start that over. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. He goes on to talk about the gulf between them, and that there was no way to communicate back to his family. He wanted him to go back to tell my brothers about this badness and this hotness. And you know what? He said they had the Moses and the prophets. The scriptures teach about a place called hell. The scriptures teach about a place called torment. And the scriptures teach that we need to be aware. I'm taken aback by the anguish and the, and the desire for just one touch of water on the tongue. And that, evidently that relief was not all. That's, that's one aspect of the message of hell. But tonight, we want to look at some different things that congregations teach, that people teach, that, that um, we need to keep our focus on preaching and teaching biblical truths. And the reason I continually remind ourselves of that is because it's not uncommon in this world today for preachers, teachers, Congregations, denominations, whatever you're going, whatever affiliation, to kind of veer away from messages on hell. And a couple of years ago, did some research on this. I wanted to look at some of the the things that were said on uh, church websites, quote unquote, church websites about their message, about their preaching. I just want to go over a couple of things. These are from real websites. I'm not going to mention who they were or whether or not they were denominational or whatever. But look at some of the things that, that churches are saying about the things that are being preached. There's no fire and brimstone here. No Bible thumping. Just practical, witty messages. Another one. Services here have an informal feeling. You won't hear people threatened with hell or reference to as sinners. What about this one? The goal is to make them feel welcome and not driven away. I don't disagree with that wholeheartedly. Certainly, we need to be made to feel welcome. But if I think that preaching the gospel, preaching the Bible, preaching the truth is going to drive people away, I doubt the power of God. Principles are to be taught and preached. And if I think that I am going to drive people away with the truth, now, mind you, how things are delivered, the way they're said, voice inflection, the, your attitude, that's very, very important. But we need balanced preaching. And balanced preaching includes preaching on hell. Two more. Another one. As with all clergymen, our preacher's answer is God slips him in at the end and even doesn't get heavy even then it doesn't get heavy no ranting no raving no fire no brimstone he doesn't even use the H word I've already used it about ten times tonight the sermons here are relevant upbeat and best of all short you won't hear a lot of preaching about sin and damnation and hellfire preaching here doesn't sound like preaching it's sophisticated, urbane, and friendly talk. It breaks all stereotypes. Those are some characterizations about certain preaching at certain places. Folks, I know there's probably been a lot said, or most of which I don't know, about my style of preaching or other styles of preaching. But to say something as bad as what we've seen, I think that's a... that's. On the, on the preacher at those places. Slips God in at the end. Doesn't use the H word. We need to be careful. Not to be afraid to preach the truth of God's word. Some facts about hell tonight. And we're going to look at the idea of a lost soul. Of all of these sermons that are in this series. And sermons, other sermons that I preach. 
the most important thing that I would like my audience to take away is the importance of not being lost, of your soul not being lost. I, I don't want to put a, a level of importance or this is more important than the next. Certainly, this morning's sermon was very important. Certainly, uh, uh, a message about congregations remaining faithful is important. I can think no of no other topic, though, that is more important than the salvation of your soul. You can change congregations. You can get more opportunities. You only have one soul and one chance at saving that soul. One of the things we know about hell is that it is eternal. And, and the reason I bring out this point is because there are many that teach that it's not eternal. There are many that teach lots of different things on hell. Now, what I'd like to do is bring out what the Bible teaches about the everlastingness or the uh, eternal aspect of hell itself. When we look at Matthew chapter 25 and verse, I'll read verse 44 starting. Then they also will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick person and you did and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, Surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of these, the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. The punishment of judgment is everlasting. And the arguments that are used against heaven, some people will argue against the, the idea of heaven, some of those same arguments can be used against hell. In, if hell is not eternal, then neither is heaven. We talk about going off to eternity forever and ever, but some would teach that if you go to hell for a short time, uh, and then you're, it, there's different categories, and, and maybe you're, you're relieved of that. And that's just certainly not true. Mark chapter 9 and verse 44, uh, another idea of the everlasting effects of eternity. Think about that when you are thinking about your soul. Think about that when you're making a decision that could jeopardize your salvation. The, the consequences are lifelong plus everlasting eternity. Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. And he said to them, Assuredly I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God present with power. And that's not the right verse. Mark 9, 44. Drop down to verse 42 in Mark chapter 9. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for if a millstone were hung around his neck and thrown into the sea. Now, Jesus is speaking to his disciples about causing people to stumble, causing them to fall, causing them to, to um, uh, fall back and, and to stumble out of faith. And he says, you know what? It would be better for you if you were thrown in the sea with a millstone. Now, a millstone in this time, in this context, would be as big or bigger than a van. I mean, these things were huge. Okay? And when they tie that around your neck and throw you in the lake, there's no hope. You're dropped down to the middle, and that's it. He says, it would be better if a millstone was tied around your neck. If your hand causes you to sin, verse 43, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life into life maimed rather than having two hands and go to hell into the fire that shall, look, never be quenched where the worm does not die and the fire does is not quenched. It never stops. It always keeps burning. There is no relief in hell. And I know how this sounds. It, 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 trust me, these are not the favorites for preachers to preach. We're talking about hot, not getting any better, and no relief, and no tip of your finger on the tongue. No, sorry. No communication back. No able to tell your friends and relatives. None of that thing to think about. I thought about this many a time, and every time that I preach a sermon on hell, I, I get really concerned for the Kyle and Amelia and Reagans of this world, okay? I don't want to scare the little kids to death, 
But you know what? Part of my motivation, I'd say 60%, you're putting numbers on it, 60% or so of my motivation of remaining faithful is I don't want to go to hell. And you know what? I heard when I was 10, 11, 12, well, really, from the time I was real little, was lessons on eternal damnation and fire. Balance is what we need. Hell is eternal. It lasts forever. Fire not quenched is eternal. Also, hell is a place of darkness. When we were studying in John on our Wednesday night class, we talked about the light came into the world. And, and people uh, that were in the darkness didn't like the light because it exposes their evil deeds. Hell is a place absent of light. Think about that. It's not only hot, it's dark. And there's no light. There, it's eternal, it's dark, it's hot. Not just darkness, but the blackness of darkness. Not just the blackness of darkness, that's pretty dark. But outer darkness. It's, it's, a, it's a lost, dark place. Imagine living eternally in fear and darkness. Everlasting fire. Hell is a place farthest removed from the light. God is light. Therefore, God won't be in hell. There will be no light. There will be no God. God will not be in hell with the lost. Total removal. If you read the account that we talked about this morning about Adam and Eve, that sin that came into the world, that, that falling away with the serpent, and what happened to them that they were cast out of the garden. And it's the same at judgment. Hell is eternal. Hell is a place of darkness. There will be no one who will listen to your prayers or hear you scream for mercy. And darkness is pretty terrifying. I don't know about you. I'm, I'm scared of the dark. I'm going to admit that. I'm scared of the dark. When I grew up in Rolling Brook, I used to visit with uh, you know Greg and Barry and all these different people well all of a sudden it'd be 10 30 at night and I'd realize I've got about a quarter mile to walk home in the dark and rolling room which even made it worse and about 15 paces into my walk home I'd be jogging and about 20 paces into my jog I'd be running and I ran home because I was afraid of the dark my brothers, I have brothers that were very mean to me at times. I was the baby of the family, and my brothers were older, and we shared a bedroom down in the basement. There were four of us total. And uh, they used to turn out the lights and make me cry, and I was so afraid. I was so feared of the dark. Darkness is terrifying, and we seek security in light. It, it's such a refreshing thing when, when we're... In the blackness of darkness of night, like it will be in hell, and the light comes on. Oh, well, that's very helpful. Hell is eternal and hell is dark. In this next slide, we're going to look at a few verses about another characteristic, which is what we're talking about, lost souls and the characteristic of hell. is a place of fire. Matthew chapter 13, I'm not going to read every one of these verses. Matthew chapter 13, verse 42 talks about the furnace of fire. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41, we just looked at, is an everlasting, talking about the, the, the duration of the fire. Mark chapter 9, verse 44 and 45, talk about the hotness of the fire. Do you, you know there's different levels of hotness in fire? Some fire can be this degree, some fire can be this degree. Fire and brimstone mentioned in Revelation 20 verse 10 and then also a lake of fire think about that it's hard to imagine it, 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 when when you are cooking or when you're ironing or when some, and you touch that stove and you go, oh, have you ever done that it hurts just on your pinky or, or whatever can you imagine your whole body covered in that it, you almost can't even fathom it and, and today, in our fleshly bodies, if we were put to that 
uh, torture, we'd probably pass out from pain, not in hell. You see, you have a spiritual body that's always going to be hot, always going to be begging, always going to be asking Abraham to send Lazarus and put a drop of water on my tongue and always being rejected. Hell is an eternal place, a dark place, and a place of fire where the fire is not clean. Hell is also a place of pain with no rest and no relief. Again, Matthew chapter 25, Jesus warned of the offenses that people would do, and he, he warned people, and, and he told people in Matthew 25 and verse 30, up to 29, for to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will be uh, get, have an abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away and cast in cast the unprofitable servant I would I would underline that and make sure that you understand the concept of being a profitable servant and cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth the the term gnashing of teeth indicates great pain when I was young, I was 11 or 12, we just talked about this at my mother's the other day. I come down a hill on a bicycle, and I think I was doing about 40 on this bicycle, and my chain come off. You ever had that happen? I'm coming down this hill on a bicycle, and my chain come off. No brakes. No brakes. And I hit a concrete ditch, flipped off the bicycle, and the first thing to touch out of all my body, that concrete ditch, was this section right here. I took about 15 stitches across my forehead. But before I did, my mother took me to the emergency room and that doctor took a needle and he was going to put that needle right in that cut. You know what my mother did? She handed me a hairbrush. And she said, son, just bite down on this handle as hard as you can. Gnashing her teeth, painful. It was painful. Sometimes when we try to deal with pain, we, we do that through tensing and gritting, weeping. Weeping and gnashing, gnashing of teeth. Revelation chapter 14 is another passage that addresses that issue about the pain and the no rest or relief of hell and a lost soul. The Bible tells us in verse 11, and the smoke of their torment ascends how long forever and ever and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name there is no rest day or night because it's eternal torment I've been very tired at times and I've needed rest and it's, it's torture not to be able to rest you know one of the ways that that uh, in times past people have tortured people in war and stuff like that is sleep deprivation. It's pretty much a torture. No rest, no sleep, lasts forever. Now, this is something that you may not know. Maybe you've heard this before. Hell is a place that is worse for some than others. Did you know that? It's not all the same. Matthew chapter 11 demonstrates this. I want you to turn there with me. Matthew chapter 11 talks about uh, this. And we'll look. Beginning verse 21. Actually, verse 20. Then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done for you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom 
in the day of judgment than for you. Think about it like this. If you never knew, if you never heard, if you never obeyed, if you never lived in a foreign Africa desert, and you never heard the Word of God, and you never enjoyed the spiritual blessings of the church like we do, if you never had that experience, and you die and go to hell, it's bad. But if you did, if you were saved, if you are a member of the church, if you're like us and, and, and you're trying and you're living your daily life and you're, and you're living scripturally and something happens in your life and, and you fall away and you end up in hell. And you think, man, I could have had heaven. Man, I don't have to be here. It's worse. It's worse. It's worse for you knowing where you could have been. It's worse for some. Luke chapter 12 and verse 47 also demonstrates that hell is a place that is worse for some. Luke chapter 12 beginning in verse 47. And the servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. I were to die on Marie 48, but he who did not know, this is what I was talking about earlier, but he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom uh, much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. It seems like if, if we know Christ, if we know the idea of going to heaven and we end up in hell, be worse. If I were to die out of Christ, I would much rather die in a faraway land and never have heard the message of heaven. Never have been given that opportunity. It would seem that that, it's still going to be bad either way, but it would seem that that would be better. A couple more slides and the lesson will be yours. Concerning a lost soul. I like the idea of having hope. Hope in heaven is what carries us through the day, the week. Hope in heaven, hope of eternity. When we go to funerals and when we uh, encourage people who are mourning in the church, I, I've often said this, I don't know how people do it without the church. It certainly is harder, but if I died tonight, be joyful. I have hope of eternity in heaven, right? And, and that's what really motivates us and keeps us going. But hell is a place of no hope, as we read in Matthew 25, 46. The punishment is everlasting. Now, I don't typically quote non-scriptural things, but there's a book that's called Dante's Inferno. Maybe you've heard of it. It's a book about hell. And he correctly stated in his poem that the sign above hell's gate ought to read, those who enter this door leave all hope behind. Can you imagine having no hope? Can you imagine the absence of promise? Can you imagine the, the absence of God and light and heaven? People in hell have no hope. Now, I understand that this is not a typical gospel sermon. And the description that the Bible gives, and there are more of them, but the description that the Bible gives about hell is very graphic. And I think there's a purpose for that graphicness. We need to understand that, that the, the consequences of a lost soul is eternal damnation in hell fire. And, and of course we don't, some preachers, and I've seen them, uh, some preachers will preach that like it's something they you know hope comes to somebody. I don't know. I certainly don't anyone to experience that. That's our, what we should be motivated to, to share the good news. To share the good news of Christ. To, to, that Christ came into the world and gave His blood to buy the church, to redeem it, to, to pull it out, to snatch it out of the fire, to, to, to redeem you from that lostness so you don't end up like the rich man, begging for relief. And the good thing is, 
contrary to what some Calvinists would teach, is that it's your choice. There are some that would teach you're, you're destined to this and destined to that, no matter what you do, and that's called Calvinism. But it is your choice. God has given us a free will. We can make responsible choices about how we live eternally. Work out your own salvation. Choose this day who you will serve. Repent or perish. All throughout Scripture, we are given the choice to follow God's Word and stay out of hell. But sometimes, we just don't think about that. I don't think that hell is something that certainly comes to the forefront of your mind every day of your life. Maybe it don't. But then again, if preachers never preach on hell, what's the motivation? What's your fear? I don't think people talk about hell enough. I don't think that people uh, explain that the Bible shows about hell enough. I don't think people are concerned about hell. Do you think for one moment that this world especially is thinking about hell? I don't think they think about that at all. We have a choice to make. If you go to hell, it's going to be because you chose that for yourself. That's another thing that I think makes it worse, is knowing that we have that choice, and after we end up there, thinking, man, I could have avoided this. Tonight, you have an opportunity. And I want you seriously to, to listen to your soul and look deep inside your heart. Examine yourself and make sure that hell is out of the question. I trust in the grace and the mercy of Christ. I trust in the grace and the mercy of God. I trust that God will say, will do exactly what He says He will do. I trust that. I know that when He says it's a place of eternity, it is. I know that when He says that you can be saved from that, save yourself from this perverse generation, Acts chapter 4, I know that we have the choice to do that. And I'm so glad that we do. I want you to choose heaven. I think you want you to choose heaven. And there's a way that we do that. A lost soul is the saddest sermon ever written. A lost soul is the saddest thought when we lose our loved ones and we know they've never darkened the door of church. We know that they never did the Word of God. They, we know that they never obeyed the Gospel. We know what the Bible teaches about their condition. We don't judge them, and we certainly don't pronounce them in certain places, but we know. You can know the truth, John 8, 32, and the truth will set you free. We can know that. And it's so troubling when we have loved ones or relatives that pass away, and we know that they have not obeyed. It's so troubling. But the converse of that is that we know, just like I spoke about at Sue's funeral, when a member of the church passes, when a faithful member of the church passes, we're confident. We have hope. And it's so encouraging. Heaven or hell is the question. Heaven or hell is the question. Jesus came and gave his life on a cross 2,000 years ago so that when you hear that and you read that and you study that and you hear that message and you believe that in your heart, it's proven. 500 people saw him afterwards. He raised from the dead. All the works, all the miracles. It is, it is hard not to understand and believe that. And when we obey the gospel of Christ and confess him and submit to his will and give it to God, lay it at the cross, and repent and, and repent of our sins and we're buried in the watery grave and raised to walk in newness of life and those sins are washed away. No sin in heaven, folks. No sin will be allowed. No sin in heaven. If, there, if you show up at judgment day and you're covered in the blackness of sin, it's going to be step right over here, Mr. Bowling, and it's going to be hot and it's going to last forever. 
But when that blood covers you, when that blood covers you, the white robes and you're clean, and your garments are clean and fresh. Like wool. Enter in. Enter in, my faithful servant. Tonight, you need to make a decision based on what's going on in your life, what's going on with your soul, to caution and make sure, do not go to hell. Don't do it. You need to respond. Brother Bradley's going to come and lead us. Be coming forward. On behalf of the Longville Road Church of Christ, I want to thank you for joining us today for our worship. If you ever have an opportunity, we invite you to join us at our physical location at 1301 Lawnville Road in Kingston, Tennessee. We hope you will come experience the simplicity of New Testament Christianity, learn about God, and become a part of His family. If you have questions, if you would like to know more about the Bible, or if you would like a home Bible study, feel free to contact us by calling 865 717 0444. Or for more information, visit our website, www.lawnvilleroadcoc.org. Again, we thank you and we hope you have a blessed day.